Hello and welcome to today's Business Skills webcast, how to make a difference in the world as a time poor manager. My name is Sarah Gonzalez and I'll be your facilitator and your host for today's session. Today is all about discovering how you can make a difference, achieve social purpose and then construct your own personal plan. Now before we get started, I'd just like to let you know that we'd like to keep today as interactive as possible. So please feel free to ask questions via the ask a question box in the bottom right corner. I've got my trusty iPad here, so when we get to the Q&A session, I'll be able to hand over your questions to the presenter. I'd like to welcome today's presenter, Phil. How are you? Hi, Sarah. I'm great. Great to be here. Yeah, great to be working with you again. Um, so I'd like to really get started, just get straight into it. I yep. think everyone out there is really looking forward to today's session, and I do know that we've got a lot to cram in. Um, so I just want to take a look at the slide on the screen right now, because that slide looks amazing to me, and I would love to be there as much as I <laughs> would love to be here with you. But when, when we talk about making a difference, um, when we are time poor, you know, it seems to be a big topic but um, how and why should we be talking about it and what should we be learning yeah there's a lot to cover and and I, I want to address the why first yeah. so the why is if, if we refer back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs for example we know that that when our basic needs are met we're looking for something a little bit higher mm -hmm. something with a bit more meaning and something with a bit more purpose but because we're time poor how do we get that yep so what I want to do today is bridge that gap between we know what we want and how do we actually get it. So it's going to be very valuable if you're just generally time poor, um, learning how you can connect with community and, and mm. do something with purpose. But it's also going to be handy if you're already involved in your community, but you're feeling a little bit um, worn out or you're taking on too much. So it might help you cut back and focus on one or two things rather than, than trying to do five things poorly. And the way we're going to do that is look at someone who's inspired me and I'm going to step through what they did and then unpack how they did it because there's three essential elements that need to come together. So we're going to walk through those elements mm -hmm. so everyone will be able to construct their own plan after that. Excellent. And is this something that's just a nice to have or is it something that's a little bit more serious than that? Well, there's certainly, um, it goes a little bit beyond nice to have. Mm. I think it, it's about, you know, because we really want that meaning and purpose if we can get it. So it, it's a little bit more essential than nice to have. But from the other perspective, I think there's a, a prevention angle to this conversation as well. Um, for example, sometimes, you know, we're so busy, 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 we, we head along in life and it can be months or even years until we stick our head up and say, yeah. where am I? What's going on? I don't yep. know if you've had that experience. A few times. <laughs> and when you stick your head up, you, you thought you were swimming close to the shore, mm. but now you've found you've slowly drifted out to sea yep. and you're in a vulnerable place, you're in a, a, um, a potentially sort of dangerous place and you can have crises. Mm. And, and that crisis can be about going, wow, I really need these things, but I don't have them. What do mm. I do now? And crises can lead into physical health issues mental health issues and even relationship problems. Mm. So I'd argue if, if we get the balance right today, we're better off going into the future. Yeah, and I noticed um, a few people, thank you for submitting uh, when you completed the registration form, some information on what they're hoping to learn and what they're hoping to gain from today. And I think a lot of people, uh, for a lot of managers out there especially, it's about you know understanding that the people who you're managing or yourself sometimes, you know, you've got the work-related stuff that you're dealing with, but that can also impact your personal life and vice versa. Yeah. And someone mentioned um, that they, and I'm aware of it as well, that many people are putting in uh, volunteer days and stuff like that. Does that stuff sort of help or are we looking at much more deeper things here? It certainly helps and I think we though have to take a, a much more holistic view yeah. of this because what works for you is going to be different to what works for me and it's going to be different for everyone out there because mm. we've all got different things going on in our lives. So employee volunteering opportunities or corporate volunteering opportunities uh, are quite useful but, but just remember they are constructed by your employer therefore they may tick the box for you or they may not. Mm. And there might be things outside of work that you're looking to do as well. So I'd just say step back and, and take a bigger picture view here. Um, an interesting little aside there is for every charity that I talk to that has a great experience with corporate volunteering, mm. I generally find one that has a not so great experience. Mm. Um, so for example, a lot of uh, corporates might uh, ring up a couple of days beforehand, um, before they were going to do a team-based volunteering event, they say, oh, look, a big announcement's been made at work. We need to put this back a week or a month. And the poor charity, which is totally um, lacking resources to organise anything in the first place, 
um, just cannot reschedule it for another month. It's mm. taken a lot of work to get to here. So sometimes the, the two sectors um, don't understand each other well enough to make it work properly. And there's a standing joke in the social sector that there's only, only so many times you can go and paint the Matthew Talbot hostel. <laughs> right? So, um, you know, there, there's pros and cons to that. But I think what we're talking about today is a plan for you that's going to be more um, suited to you individually mm. rather than what your employer might be offering up. Okay. Yeah. Um, turning the tables on you now because okay. I can. <laughs> um, have you ever been a time poor manager? I certainly have been. Yes. And I'll give you the very brief backstory. I yeah. grew up in Hobart and then I moved to Sydney when I was 21 and I started working with an insurance company as a trainee actuary. Okay. I don't know if you know what actuaries do, <laughs> uh, but I'll fill you in. They do all the statistical work for life insurance companies. Yep. Really exciting, I'm sure, yep. for most people out there. Yep. Um, so you can help calculate life insurance premiums mm. and all that. Um, now, but there is a very important reason actuaries exist. That is to make accountants look charismatic. Okay, so there you go. Boom, tish. <laughs> um, but I started off there. I did that for two years. Then I moved into the investment mm. um, operations. And, and I had a 19-year career in corporates in, in investment and finance roles. Now, 18 years in, and sorry, most of that um, time was managing teams as well. 18 years into my 19 year career, if you looked at my personal balance sheet, um, you would have seen that Phil is, he's married, he's got two kids, um, his mortgage is under control, he's earning fairly good money. You know, anyone would kill for that, right? Mm. Um, but what you didn't see in that, I guess, fairly accounting based view of, of of your life is that I was very time poor. Mm. I was leaving home around 5 a.m. I was getting home at 6.30 p.m. saying hi to Karen and the kids when I came yeah. in the door and then probably jumping straight back on emails, yeah. right? So very time poor and just somewhere inside of me, I felt this need to want to connect with the people around me in mm. my community, but I just didn't have time to do it. Mm. So I found myself in that situation that I'd had my head down for years and when I stuck my head up to look around, I'd been dragged out to sea and that set off a little bit of a personal crisis. Now, this is not therapy. I'm not going to yeah. drag you through that. I'm on a, I'm uh, a couch, so. <laughs> it does seem like uh, that sort of setup. <laughs> but I will say that, you know, we, we make jokes about midlife crises and things like that. But when things get out of whack, mm. it can be serious. It's not a matter of days or weeks to yep. get through it. Um, it can take a couple of years to, to work through these things. But the point to all that is, knowing what I know now, I think I could have applied that really effectively back mm. then and headed a lot of that off. Now, as things turned out, they're okay, but I could have, uh, I think, avoided all the risk in, in the meantime and, and produced a much better outcome. Would you say you felt trapped? Oh, definitely trapped. Mm. And, and I wonder if anyone else out there is, you know, thinking mm. about their day job and feeling yeah. a little bit trapped. So not only do we have financial obligations, um, maybe our kids are at private school or we've got a big mm. mortgage or other thing or car finance. Um, I, I looked around myself um, when I was working in the corporate landscape and I saw a bunch of people who, who really had two options. Mm. So option number one, and these may resonate with you. Option number one is, okay, I'm just gonna get my head down, I'm gonna keep working, I'm hoping my career is gonna go well, I get promotions mm. or I, I run my own business. And then in five, 10, 15, 20 years time, I'll retire early and I'll give something back. Yeah. So that's the conversation a lot of us have. Yeah. Which is sort of okay until we start saying, well, I don't wanna wait. 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Mm. And at the same time, we don't know how life's going to play out for us. A lot of things can happen. So do we even get in that position? And the third thing is that I think deep down we see other people out there doing stuff and we have a little nagging sense of guilt that we're not pulling our weight mm. or, or paying our way. So option number one is we just put our head down, keep doing what we're doing with the view that maybe one day we'll give something back. Now, option number two is a little bit more radical. Mm. That's total life change. That's when you sell your BMW yeah. and you buy a combi van. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and you head up the mid-north coast. You go to Byron or Bellingen yep. or Nimbin or, or somewhere that has a B in it. And, uh, and then you try a new life up there. Mm. And that can work for some people, but it doesn't work for everyone. Mm. So why? that's a risky proposition. Do you have to have that level of risk? So I would say, yes, we feel sort of boxed in, mm. option A, option B. And what I've been doing is, is taking note of people who've managed to get that balance right and create option C, mm. which is a much more balanced life. And, and that's where I found the three common um, elements that came together that, that really locked together and worked for them in, in doing that. So that's mm. where we're going today is to find out what those elements yeah. are. Yeah, so would you say that um, you leaving the corporate world and doing what you're doing now is your combi van moment? 
Uh, look, <laughs> it was it's an interesting path here. I, yeah. To be honest, there were certain drivers that, that saw me um, just wanting to leave that industry, not because I didn't like the nature of the work. It, it was just the right time. And you get to age 39 or mm. 40 and you say, is this the rest of my life? Mm. And you've got to make a call there. Um, so it wasn't, there, there was elements of that that were about general career and lifestyle, but there was elements about being time poor mm. and getting in a crisis situation. Um, but to be honest, getting to where I am today was a pretty strange path. Mm. If you, I think, mapped a bumblebee going around in, yeah. in circles, you, you'd probably get there. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the plan. Now, mm -hmm. we want to create a plan for mm -hmm. ourselves and not every plan is going to be the same. So does that mean we need to actually prepare before we plan? We need Which to prepare. <laughs> yeah, we've, got, we've got three preparation yes. points. And okay. uh, I've got to try and work the clicker here on, there we go. on the slides. Okay. Number one. Number one is effort versus outcome. Mm. So I just want to use a business analogy. So Redback conferencing. Yes. How do you measure success? You'd be thinking about profitability. Mm -hmm. So we all understand in business, profitability is, yeah. is the way we think about success. We also know that that's a function of revenue mm -hmm. and we go, yay, if revenue is going up, yep. but we can't judge success by revenue alone mm. because if expenses are rising faster, then we're not, not doing yep. a good job. So um, the point is it's, it's a two dimensional thing. We've got the good stuff, revenue, and we've got the energy and resources consumed yep. that, that go into producing it. To take that into a personal situation, Sometimes we go out there and do things that make us feel good and make us feel satisfied. Mm. And that's like our revenue line. Mm. Um, but we've also got to think about how much energy is going into producing that. Because if you're out, if you're putting in 12 hour days at work mm. and then you're going home and you're spending two or three hours working or doing some role for a charity, yep. then you're going to be totally burnt out mm -hmm. and you're not going to be enjoying life very much, mm -hmm. which means you're not going to sustain what you're doing, mm -hmm. which is no good for you. And it's probably no good for the people you're trying to do it for. So we've just got to get this balance right. Because we're feeling time poor, we've got to do more with less. Yes. So let's be really smart about what we choose to do and get the maximum impact from it. And that's, again, what today is all about. So just keep that in mind. It's not just about the good stuff, the satisfying moments, but it's also about managing the energy that goes into it. Mm. Okay, what else do we need to do to prepare this master plan? The, 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 second, the second point is... Um, trying to understand how much should we contribute mm. and I don't know if that's an easy question for you to answer mm. um, but I, I'd ask you to think of someone who inspires you and I'm putting you on the spot yep. a bit Sarah but <laughs> is there someone in the world you know or in Australia who you look up at and go wow I, I like what they do and mm. I'd love to be like them yeah is there anyone there um I I do have a someone who really does inspire me um, is Lisa Wilkinson. Okay. I would say I think you know she's a really strong female presence in Australia. I think she's worked hard to get where she is. She seems to be on top of things and has it all. But I think she's strong in her convictions as a person as well, and she doesn't back down easily. And I I actually really really admire that about yeah. someone. So I'm not quite sure what answer you no, usually well, get for that, but that's, that's well, uh, she's always been one of my. I haven't got that one yet, <laughs> um, but I, I get lots of um, different answers for mm. that question. And, and, and so for you, it's Lisa Wilkinson. Mm. For me, it's, it's other people. Like the last two Australians of the year, mm. Adam Goods and Rosie Batty, I look, I look up to them and I'm in awe of what they mm. do. And for everyone out there, you, you're probably thinking of someone um, completely different. And we tend to sit here and look up at those people and go, wow, they're so wow. awesome. Could I be like them? Then we have that little deflating moment. And we get back to work. <laughs> yeah, no, back to work. We'll put that's 5, 10, 15, 20 years time yeah, away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sometimes we get disheartened. Mm. So that raises the question, well, how do we set a manageable benchmark or, or target for ourselves? Mm. And I, I really struggled with this question, so I kept asking lots of people about it. And I was sitting having a coffee with a friend of mine, Jenny, who does some great work in communities south mm -hmm. of Wollongong. I was having a coffee with Jenny, and I asked this question. I was stirring my, my black coffee, and... Jenny said, you know, I think we should contribute a lot relative to our capacity to contribute. And that was the point where I stopped stirring my black coffee and I said, Jenny, just hold on. I just want to write that down. Yeah. That we should contribute a lot relative to our capacity to contribute, which is very important, again, when we're feeling time poor. Mm. Because even if you only have five minutes a week to make a difference, mm. maybe that's one phone call. And one phone call to, to one person that makes a difference in their life. Mm. So we go through different stages in our life where we can only contribute five minutes. So what is that one activity we can do? Mm. And that becomes our benchmark. So instead of saying, I've got to be like Lisa Wilkinson tomorrow, 
that'd be nice, mm. but it might be unachievable. Let's set a meaningful benchmark so that you can look back at the end of the year and say, I did it, I achieved the thing I was going to, and I mm. feel good about it. And that's obviously going to rub off on people who uh, who you're managing as well, isn't it? If they see you being like this as a person, because obviously if you're time mm. poor, you get stressed out and all these other things, you know, accumulate, it's like a domino effect really. Yeah. People see that and they see you get stressed out through certain ways that you behave. Um, so being able to do this is not only going to help yourself, but possibly other people who you won't even realise. Yeah, I think it really kicks your attitude yeah. along. So there's the attitude that, well, I'm just focusing on work, I'm a work person and, mm. and I'm going to drive everyone hard at work and I'm totally stressed if things aren't going well at work. Yeah. And then there's the person who takes too much on yep. and, and therefore gets frazzled and, and comes to work pretty grumpy. Mm. You know, let's find that middle ground. Yeah. The goal, I think, would be to be that person that someone else wants to aspire to, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, you kind of sort of. <laughs> We're going to come to that soon. Okay, sorry. Yeah. What are we going to next? We've the got third a third step. preparation okay. point and uh, this... This is probably something obvious, but I just want to mm. point it out anyway. There's many ways we can make a difference. Mm. So it's not just about things we can say do at work through yep. corporate volunteering. Yep. It's what we do outside of work. Mm -hmm. uh, when we're outside of work, we, we could do this through a formal charity yep. or volunteer um, volunteering opportunity, or we could go and do our own thing. Mm. And I also want to increase, I guess, people's perspective on what doing something good is, because let's say you're visiting a relative mm. and you're spending an hour a week with them because they're ill or, or there's something, some issue they've got. I think that should be included in your, your budget of, mm. or your, sorry, your impact in, in doing something good. So recognize some of those things you're already doing because you, know, you might feel much better about what you are doing. Mm. And let's say you had a choice to spend an extra 20 minutes doing something, maybe it makes sense to help that person for an extra 20 minutes yep. rather than trying to pick up something completely new. And everyone's definition of good is going to be different, isn't exactly. it? So don't yeah. feel so hard on yourself. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so they're the three steps for preparation. Let's get into the plan. Okay, so I'm going to talk about someone who's inspired me. Mm -hmm. and, and that person is in this photo here. Now, in the right-hand side of this photo is, uh, is Lynn. Now, Lynn lives in Hobart. Mm -hmm. And this is Lynn when she was young, by the way, because today okay, I was gonna <laughs> <laughs> she's, uh, she's, Go a, Lynn. <laughs> she's a busy bank branch supervisor in, yep. her, in her day job. Um, by the way, on the left hand side of this photo is is um, is my brother, Scott, who yep. unfortunately passed away last year. And uh, so he's no longer with us um, in the middle of this photo. This chubby, checkered, little cheeky kid. Um, is yours truly? No. <laughs> so you know you. I haven't been able to stop staring at that little kid okay. since they came up. <laughs> so did George Clooney look that cute when he was young? I don't okay, know, but okay. you know, we're doing yep. our best. <laughs> so uh, so Lynn lives in Hobart, mm -hmm. and um, she's a busy bank branch supervisor by yep. day. She lives 20 minutes out of Hobart, which by Hobart standards is a pretty long commute. Mm -hmm. um, now, when she drives home, she turns off the highway and she goes about a kilometre down a road, which is a dead end road. Mm -hmm. At the end of this road, there's about 40 houses and they, they fan out in a scallop shell sort of shape. And most of them have these great views over mm. a lagoon. There's oyster beds and it's just a nice part of the mm. world. Now, in 2005, Lynn was sitting down with her friend Sue and she said to Sue, look, I really enjoy living here, but I'd love to know more of my neighbours. Um, I tend to just interact with them when I'm reversing out of the driveway in the morning. Mm. And if I see someone else, we give each other a wave. But I'd feel much more safe and secure if I knew more of my neighbours. Yep. So what Lynn and Sue did was they did a letterbox drop and they said morning tea on in, in a week's time. You know, yep. come around if you can. A few people came around. Um, the following month, they did it again, a few more. Um, the month after, more again. And it's been going now for 10 years. So these nice. monthly morning tea events. Yeah. Now, what is that doing? Um, well, what that, that's doing is, is several things. Um, one, every family puts in $5 and they collect the money and donate to charity. And I think they've raised more than $5,000 in that 10 mm. year period, or it's probably much more now. Um, at these events, they really engaged families in the community. One family brought along four generations of their family to one wow. morning tea event. Um, there was another really nice story where an old lady, um, Maureen, she couldn't live in her house independently anymore. So she sold and, and went into a retirement home or a nursing home. Mm. Now, while she was there, um, someone would bring her back for these morning tea events. And the young family that had moved into her house um, would clip some flowers from the garden and come and present it to Maureen. So they were the flowers she planted, wow. which is a really nice thing. And one of the other benefits it's had is that when the council was looking to put in a boat ram that didn't quite make sense, then um, this was a forum 
for the community to get together and talk about it and, and, and I guess put forward a coherent response to the council. So we can see that that works on many levels. It works on the level of, of Lynn being time poor. Mm -hmm. This is a once a month activity. So it, it gets that big tick. Um, and the other thing is that we, we think about the $5,000 or more that they've raised and we go, isn't that great? Mm. But at the same time, I'd say everything else it's done, building, I guess, the social fabric in that community, um, you cannot buy. Mm. That can only be created by the people in it. So as the MasterCard ads say, that's priceless. Mm. So I think, um, you know, Lynn has certainly inspired me because when I was looking around at how to do this, um, I looked at that simple example and I thought, yeah, that works. Mm. And uh, we might get into looking behind it a little more. Yeah, um, that's something I didn't really expect when you said you were going to give an example because yeah. it's amazing how one small idea can just transform. And I think even doing that within an organisation, mm. you know, within a company and being able to do that or as a team would just be remarkable. Yeah. So what are or what were the elements that really came into play here with yeah. this story? How does, how does it all come together? Good question. There were, there were three elements um, that, that came into this um, story and I think we've got a chart here, yeah. Um, so the first thing is because, again, we're time poor, mm. we should play to our strengths. Mm. So doing more with less, you know, why go and reinvent the wheel when we've got something working for us? So in Lynn's case, um, she's very personable yep. and she's very social. With, um, she likes social situations. Mm. So that sort of lines up with this idea that um, she's the person bringing this gathering together. Mm. Uh, let's say you're an accountant, then yes, going and volunteering for a charity to do their accounts mm. would, would be natural and we call yeah. that skilled volunteering. But if you're not an accountant, it wouldn't really make a lot of sense for you to go and say, I'll come and do your accounts because that would probably mean <laughs> doing a three year accounting course. Yeah. That just doesn't make sense. Yeah. So let's identify our strengths and play to them. So that's what Lynn's done really well. That's number one. So do you just write them down? Um, we'll come back to that in, in a minute as yeah. to how we're going to go through this. I'll just step through Lynn's yep. three first. Yep. Um, the second thing is in doing this, she was addressing a core life need mm. that she had. Now, I don't know if you remember why Lynn and Sue decided to take this on. Um, Lynn said to Sue, look, I want to feel more safe and secure in neighbors. my community. Yep. Yeah. So this just wasn't some whim that she had. Wouldn't that be a great thing to do mm. for no reason whatsoever? This was actually addressing a need that she had. Yep. So I want to come back to these core life needs shortly yep. and tell you what other types of needs there are. Uh, but so far, we've talked about Lynn's strengths, Lynn's needs, mm -hmm. now we've got to look externally and say what's the community benefit or what's the social mm. issue or trend that she's addressing. In, in Lynn's case, it's not so clear, but I'm going to explain what it is. Um, because a lot, a lot of people ended up coming along to these events, they obviously, obviously saw value in it and they felt they wanted that sense of belonging, just mm. like Lynn did in a way as well. So within her community, there was, a, I guess, a, an unmet need and that was the sense of belonging. and. Uh, feeling the same way she did. So the social issue in this case is belonging. Mm. Now, if you go and work for a charity, their, their mission or cause is pretty clear. But in, in Lynn's case, she was just tapping into to that need amongst her, um, her neighbours. Mm. Okay. So, so we've got to bring these three things together. Mm. And uh, I've got a picture of a money box up here. Uh, I don't know if you ever had one of these, but I used to have a Commonwealth Bank one that was green. Yep. And it had a code. I think my code was 007, by the way. And Every young boy in the neighbourhood probably had the same code. Um, but you'd have to twiddle the three dials mm. to get the right code or combination to open the safe. Ah. So this is a similar process. Yep. So those three elements, you know, what are they for you? What are they for me? What are they for people watching? And how do we get the right combinations to work? Yeah, how do you bring all of those elements together? That's well, what I'm... We, we have to, I guess, step through, through the process. Yeah. So I'm going to go through each element in turn. Yep. So identifying your strengths, you mentioned, you know, do we just write them mm. down? Well, we can, but I, I'd suggest we can go a little bit further than that and mm -hmm. be a bit more effective. So um, it's much better if you do it with a trusted friend or colleague because they can see things that you can't. Mm. And sometimes you get blinded by your own strengths. Yeah. So it helps if someone else is helping us. And as long as they're a trusted colleague or friend, that, that will work. Yep. And I'd I challenge you to think in uh, these three different categories. So think about things in your character, um, capabilities or skills that you have. Mm -hmm. So if you're an accountant, you know, accounting might be your thing. Yep. Um, and connections. So what types of networks do you have, whether they're social networks or networks of friends or maybe work colleagues that you really get on well with and want to do something together? Think about what all those connections are because they can be valuable in mm. certain situations. 
So that's, that's a little guide about um, how to bring you, your strengths to the fore. Um, there's some other exercises you can do and later on uh, I think I'll mention a booklet you can get hold of mm -hmm. which has a few questions to challenge you such as you know when, what's the best thing you've achieved at work and, and what did you contribute to yeah. it. So when you think about that and use that framework or those three categories, it might help bring out some things bring that we're quite out. aware of. Yeah. yeah. What about the um, core life needs that you spoke of? What's that all about? There's, there's eight of them and uh, I'll, I'll run through them fairly quickly. Um, and I built this list um, from some Smith family research. Um, okay. they, they had about, I think it was five or six key needs they identified as to why people volunteer. And mm. I took them and added a few on. So very quickly, um, the types of life needs you can um, you can address um, include belonging yep a lot of us just want to have a greater sense of belonging and we saw that in Lynn's example mm. career progression yep so let's say Sarah you wanted to take over the top job here mm -hmm. um, but you felt you hadn't had the right exposure to leadership or management experience then getting that in a, a volunteering situation could be a very sensible move for you yep so you gain that skill um, s thirdly fitting into say a new community you've just moved somewhere new and, and you want to learn more about the place and how it works mm. so it's sort of related to belonging but um, in specific situations we might want to fit into a new community mm. or culture the fourth one is economic or self-interest mm. now for some people that might sound like a dirty word to do something out of self-interest mm. but I tell you what when I volunteered for my kids PNC Association for three years running I had self-interest in mind because, yeah. <laughs> right? I wouldn't be doing it if Out I didn't. Of the have, <laughs> yeah. If my kids weren't at the school, yeah. I don't think I would have done that for fun. Yeah. Um, so there so is. So it doesn't need to be a self. Like, it doesn't have to be too selfish. No. Because obviously that's for your kids as well. That's so right. It's, yeah. And and even in Lynn's situation, she wanted to feel more safe and secure. Yeah. That's a self-interest. Everyone has a yeah. yeah got it's it. not. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. Um, empathy. So uh, empathy might be when there's a cause that or a thing you've got to do that really mm. resonates with you. So I did mention um, um, the unfortunate story of my brother earlier on. Um, his daughters or my nieces mm. are very tuned into raising money for cancer research yep. because you know they've been through that experience with their father. Um, and that's uh, the reason that's different um, is, the reason that's a core life need is because I don't think that's discretionary. I think mm. that's something they really have to do rather than just might want to do. Yeah. It becomes a real driving interest for them. So that's sort of empathy. Um, the next one is expressing personal values. Some of us just want to give. Mm. And, and I have that need to, to want to give in certain circumstances. People who are aligned to a religion or a yep. philosophy might have that same driver. Self-development is about learning new skills and new things and we all want to improve somehow. And uh, the last one, work congruence. If you can find this at work, mm. then maybe that's really, you know, fantastic for you. I've got a friend who recently left the, the corporate or business world to work for a charity and that just is resonating with her so deeply really? that she just really had to find that work-life congruence. It wasn't an option. Yeah. She was, uh, you, I could see her heading there her whole life. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so once you've identified your strengths and you realised what you're good at through, you know, various amount of channels, and then you know your core life needs, how do you then find a social issue or cause or, you know, get people on board? How does that yeah, all work? Good, good question. I mean, some of us will probably naturally know what those issues mm. or causes are. Um, however, we, we might need some prompting questions as mm. well. And again, in the booklet I've got, we, some of those questions are there, but they would be, you know, what types of things do you wish you could change in your community or change in the world mm. more broadly? or when you get together with friends, what do you all complain about? Mm. Uh, so, some of these prompters will help give us a clue if, if we're not clear. Um, but the other thing I would mention is that, and I've put a whole bunch of stuff on the screen, which you can get later on anyway, so no one uh, needs to feel compelled to write this down. Yep. There's lots of different areas we can volunteer or make mm. a difference in, and there's many, many different roles that we can do. Mm. So uh, there's a pretty wide net out there, and, and don't restrict yourself um, greatly. The other thing I'd, I'd just ask people to think a little more deeply about is that quite often we're drawn to the bright lights um, of, you know, the guide dogs or some of these things that are really flashy, interesting, yeah. they really hit your heart in a very nice way. But, you know, there's a lot of organisations out there that don't get the love. Um, yeah. If you're talking about Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, there's not a lot of people queuing up to do a lot of work with them. So mm. if, if um, you were driven more by playing a particular role, yep. um, then wouldn't that be great to help out some of those charities that don't always get 
the front line uh, yeah. With cues. Yeah. I think that's an important point. Mm -hmm. um, and if anyone ha wants to find out more about these sort of social causes or anything, um, we've got a mm -hmm. huge charity program and a lot of charities that we work with, so mm -hmm. feel free to let us know. But a lot of people who become part of our charity programs here at Redback, they say it's not about the dollar value or the contributions that they receive, it's mm -hmm. about the exposure that they get and mm -hmm. the help that they need because they yeah. don't have you know, the marketing budgets and whatnot to be as well known. But there's yep. so many smaller organisations out there that mm -hmm. are just starving for someone to volunteer an hour a week or something like that and yeah. you could make a huge difference yep. um, not only yourself but if you roll out that toward in your organization as well and, and I think that picks up on a point that especially when we're time poor one of the best ways um, let's say we're earning good money mm. and we're time poor uh, there's nothing wrong with donating as a way of making a difference yeah. because by doing that you are I guess helping people do more with, mm. with your you know that's one of your strengths if you've got money that's one of your strengths yeah. and you should lever that. So yep. I think that's a very valid way to go about it. Okay. And um, so I might just come back to what do we do with all these three yeah, things? How so, do you so the idea is that we've just stepped through some ideas for recognising your strengths, mm. recognising what your core life needs are today. Yep. And thirdly, what are the social issues or causes that you want to plug into? Mm. So your challenge firstly is to, uh, it's like baking a cake. Yeah. You know, when someone comes up with a great recipe, it didn't just happen the first time they mm. tried it. They probably experimented around. So they had all the ingredients, yep. and then they had to get them in, in the right order and right combination. So our challenge is to get the right combination. So by looking at these three elements, I want you to try and link up mm. three things that work together well. And I want you to try and get you know, two, three, four, or five different options mm -hmm. of things that you think would work well together. And once you've got those options, then factor in the amount of time budget you think you have. So mm. again, if it's five minutes, you're probably then going to choose just one of those options and say, okay, well, in that I can, I can do this for five mm. minutes a week. If you have 50 minutes a week, maybe you still choose one option, but you can do a bit more. If you have five hours a week, maybe you're choosing two options. And, and so come at it from that direction. Once you've got, once you've got your options, uh, factor in your time budget mm. and then make a selection. I think that those three images, those three circles there are so powerful. I um, do some volunteer work for a charity now and mm -hmm. I chose to do that, but if my manager came to me once and said, okay, you know, would you like to be involved in you know, doing something a little bit different, making mm -hmm. a difference somehow and showed me this and asked me to evaluate, I think that yep. would have been so much pow so powerful. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, looking at that person just going, wow, like you really, really care and you care about where I'm spending my time as well. So yeah, yeah very, very important. And, and I think it's important to make a conscious choice about this mm. because again I mean I've been in situations recently where I've had to cut back on some charity work that I was doing yeah and I had to really think hard about what I did do versus what I didn't do mm. so uh, it can give you a, a bit of a framework or a method for doing that yeah, yeah. and because I think if you don't think about this you just go into it and yeah. I think that's when everything just goes a little bit crazy doesn't that's it right. yeah. and just on that and I'm so glad Angela has asked this question okay. because this is a, um, something I struggle with as well so how do you suggest dropping busy work that has a poor effect outcome or relationship busy work is in in the workplace or outside or just um, charity yeah. work do you think busy work within the workplace I'm assuming um, well I think there's uh, Look, there, there's a balance to be found with the workplace mm. and, and it's a bit hard not knowing the situation to make a comment about yeah. it. I would think um, from my own personal experience um, in, in a management situation, when I look back, I think I spent about 5% of my time managing my people mm. and 95% of the time doing the technical things and other things that I had to do. Yeah. In hindsight, I wish I'd spent 25% or, or more of my time mm. actually managing my people. Yep. Uh, I think that's far more important than the technical things I was doing. Mm. And when we tend to get into this, um, I think it was Dr. Stephen Covey talked about urgent versus important things. Yeah. So I don't know about you, but I would gravitate towards the urgent important things uh, and the important but non-urgent things I tended to shy away from. But they're mm. sometimes the things we really, really have to do. So now whether that answers the question, I don't know. But I think if you're getting things right outside of work as well, and you get a greater balance, I think you get a better perspective mm. on what the value of, of work is and you can make some better and more decisive, mm. incisive decisions about what you what you do. Yeah. So, so I, ho I hope that addressed the question. Yeah, yeah. There can be a follow-up. Um, <laughs> yeah. So in saying this, obviously you have done this, otherwise you wouldn't really <laughs> be educating <laughs> people on it. Yeah. But do you 
do you constantly, you know, do it and do you, you know, walk the talk or is it something that you struggle with at times and how do you sort of, is it something you need to come back and reevaluate, or is it something that just happens easily once you put these steps into place? I say, oh, no, I don't do it. No, of course <laughs> I do it. <laughs> uh, look, look, for example, there, there's three or four key things I, I do mm. and make a conscious decision about doing. So the big thing I took on this year was being the president of the National Speakers Association's mm. New South Wales chapter. Yeah. Now, that there's a lot of, uh, I guess, core life needs that mm. that's ticking for me. Um, in fact, I actually regard that as work time when mm. I do that. And it's a pretty heavy role from, from a volunteering perspective. Yeah. But it's, so it's, it helps me network with people I need to be networking with. Um, it helps me gain knowledge of the industry that I'm mm -hmm. working in. And as a speaker and a workshop um, facilitator and a consultant, I pick up so much from that. And uh, so it's ticking lots of boxes for me. So, so that's one conscious decision I make. Um, another thing I do is a food event in my local community mm -hmm. every three months. Help organise a curry night. Um, people come along on a Sunday night when they don't feel like cooking and they, mm. they get a $5 curry. Wow. Everyone loves that. <laughs> and uh, again, um, for me, I love cooking. Mm. I, I don't like a la carte cooking, but yeah. I love making a big pot of curry. So yeah. um, it ticks that, uh, I guess it, it stems from that, um, that strength and that need. Mm. Um, with my son's soft, uh, football club, I do some web work for them. Mm. Uh, it's pretty low time, um, it's something I can do remotely, it sort of fits in. I couldn't spend the time going down and, and being at training and all mm. that, it just wouldn't work for me. So yeah. I found the thing that works. So yeah, I've, I've found those things that I think work out pretty well. Okay, yeah. seems like you're busy then. <laughs> I look busy, but, but manageable. Do you even work? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when I was, uh, I'm running my own business now, so I work for myself yeah. and, and I do, uh, I'm running a small business. So mm. I thought I was busy when I was working in corporate life and mm. I'm probably busier now. So it's even more important now to get this right. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, now a question from Peter, um, getting introducing something like this into the workplace um, mm -hmm. as a manager, what are your tips mm -hmm. on something like that? Yeah, it's an interesting one because I, this is talking about people's, li it's almost like life coaching in, in a way, but it's, it's in a specific area. I think it's a difficult thing for employers to say to their team, look, I want you to do this and think about your life in this way. Mm. Um, so from that perspective, maybe uh, you can introduce articles and, and little tidbits of, of this conversation into publications mm. or newsletters or, or just drop it in at, at team meetings. Mm. Um, in terms of workshopping it, and, and what we're talking about here is something that, that takes a bit of work to get right. Um, for example, we've got to set those mini goals and mm. figure out what we're going to achieve in the year ahead. Um, there's a bit more work to it. So I think from that perspective, you've got to get people self-selecting yeah. in, into this um, area if it's, if it's a workshop or a coaching environment. Definitely. Yeah, I think it'd be hard to force you in and say, yes, you've yeah. got to come and do this. <laughs> you have to do this, no. Um, but, but having said that, I think it's a fantastic way for employers to support their staff mm. in a more engaging way. And um, just to quote a senior, um, it was a lawyer who was quite senior in, in the public service in New South Wales, um, they were finding out about this and, and this person said, look, wow, this is not just another training course that mm. I'm being forced to go on because I have to go on a training course. This is something that's going to make a difference in my life. Yeah. So, so imagine what that's doing in terms of enhancing um, the reputation of the employer. Mm. Yeah. And I think even as an employer, like implementing, we did touch on the beginning, but like, you know, one or two volunteer days a year and something mm. like that to sort of work people into it and see if yeah. they are interested. And, Dip their toes in the water. Yeah. Um, we're going to go to some questions now. So um, while we're going through the questions, um, we'd love you to stay online. But there's a resources tab in the bottom corner of your screen. Feels um, kindly put some resources in there, which we'll go through in a moment, and you can take those on board, print them out, um, and then save them and actually, you know, pass them on through your organisation if you like. And there's also a little tab next to the slide that says feedback. So we'd love to hear your feedback from today, um, as well as any additional comments that you may have. Um, now, just from Trent, so just moving over from the whole individual assessment thing, which we've been spending a lot of time on at the moment, what do you think of the idea that people should find a coalition of similar time poor folks and pull in ideas and experience, replicating the style of corporate work that many are used to? Okay, well, that's an interesting, it's interesting, an interesting perspective. Concept, I, yeah. I think it's a great idea. The, the pros and cons to that are one with a small motivated group and if if your values and objectives are very mm. aligned, that's such a powerful way to go. Um, the, the only, the con I can see is that requires organisation time. Yeah. And I, I talk about the, 
2220 rule. So this is my experience from being in voluntary organisations that might resonate with mm. you and, and viewers out there, is that it takes two minutes to go and buy um, a sausage sandwich from a yep. sausage sandwich fundraiser. I really it feel like a sausage sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> it takes two minutes to buy it. It takes two hours to do a shift as a yep. volunteer serving or cooking the sausages. Mm. It takes about 20 hours of organisation time. And most people would go, what? How could it take 20 hours of organisation time for a sausage fundraiser? Um, well, if you haven't been through it, um, talk to someone who has, because mm. once you talk about everything involving um, choosing the date, getting the permissions, um, doing the setup, getting everything you need to be there mm. on the day, the food, the tomato sauce, um, the, the drinks you're going to sell, the treasure to bring the float, um, roster the volunteers, pack up at the end of the day, and, and there's about five things I've missed out there. Yeah. Once you start adding it up, there's a lot of work there. So. And I think this is why we look, off, for people in the business world, we often look into charities and go, mm. well, why don't they just do that? And what we don't realise is they don't have the capacity to do that. Mm. This is a common theme in, in the work that I do that keeps coming around. When we go and suggest things to not-for-profits or charities, we should be very aware that they're not paid, they don't have the, the scope to do a lot of these mm. things. So we've got to factor that in. So I like Trent's idea, as long as they're willing to, mm. to do the, uh, the organising. Okay, um, and this probably ties into that question as well. So we've got someone, um, Karina, at a crossroads here, which I think this question will resonate with a lot of people. So from your experience and your research, what do you think provides the biggest impact? Using skills to work in a high paying job in the corporate sector where you can then donate money to a chosen, chosen cause? Or do you work for a social enterprise where you work for a lower wage but have a meaningful impact for that organisation? Oh, that's a tricky one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you for that. Not an easy one to answer, yeah. but, but I'm actually going to throw in another option here mm. to make it even, uh, I guess, more tantalising. Mm. So a lot of work I do is with businesses and helping businesses connect with social issues in a way that not only helps someone in the community, mm -hmm. but also builds on their profitability. Okay. So a very quick example of yeah. that is there's a recently documented um, a, a group of real estate agents in Western Sydney have been getting together and helping some social services providers. What they're doing is helping to tip them off when they see problems with tenants. So tenants might have financial issues or there might be domestic violence or other things going on. Mm. And what happens is when people get into that situation, they can often get evicted from their property. Okay. And they end up in a homeless situation. So they've become involved in an initiative to identify those things early and social services providers come in to support those people because sometimes people aren't aware of those, mm. that support is available. And they've, uh, out of 102 situations, they saved 57 tenancies. Wow. So there's a big social benefit in that. So that's a big tick. On the other hand, they're actually saving themselves hard costs mm. by avoiding the eviction process. So their own business is improving its profitability. Um, they're saving a lot of money for their landlords in terms of missed rent. Um, they're, they're helping to, I guess, avoid missed mm. rent and also doing up the property when you kick someone out and, and get someone new mm. in. So there's, there's a link there between financial benefit and social benefit. Yeah. And so that doesn't, now when, uh, coming back to Karina's question, a social enterprise sort of tries to do both of those things mm. at once. So I love the social enterprise model. Um, it has sometimes some challenges and that is getting capital in to do big things and do things at scale. Mm. So that's where I've seen social enterprises struggle a little bit. Um, but nevertheless, I think a well-run social enterprise will deliver just as much bang for the buck mm. um, as that situation. And so I, I challenge anyone who's in the work, in the corporate situation, to think a little bit more deeply about what they're doing at work and how they, whether it's through addressing issues in their supply chain or new products for their customers or um, just aligning what their company does with real social needs or societal needs, not just mm. keep doing the thing they've always done, but making sure they're totally aligned with what society needs mm. is a very powerful way to act as well. And I think for someone in Karina's situation or anyone else out there, um, I think going through the, that core life needs section would be mm. a massive part of answering that question, wouldn't uh, it, and finding uh, out what. Oh yeah, and you know, there's a really nice tie in here because we've still got that um, diagram on screen. Mm. We're talking about this from a personal perspective, mm. but if we look at that same diagram and say, take the business perspective, what are the strengths of the business? Yeah. What are the core strategic needs of the business? And what are the social issues or causes the business could help out with and align those three things? So in the case of the real estate agents, mm. those three things align for them and they're not only addressing a strategic need of increasing their profitability, 
They're also helping mm. with reducing homelessness, which is a social cause. And the strength I'd say they brought to the table in that case was their willingness to collaborate, their willingness to think a little bit outside the square and so get together. So it all together. ties in, doesn't it? It really yeah, ties in. Definitely. So that's an eerie parallel that we've come up with. <laughs> that <Yeah>. wasn't planned. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, that brings us to the end. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, it's been very, very insightful and I'm sure we've all learned a few things that we can take away um, and adapt ourselves or maybe even filter on to our employees as well. Um, I'd like to pass it on to you, Phil, for closing comments and thank you um, so much for today. It's been excellent just to sit down, have a chat with you and also learn a little bit more about you as well. Great. Um, but yeah, closing comments for anyone else out there and how would you what would you like to people people to walk away with yeah today? well I'd say go out and do it so um, mm. in the I think it's the resources tab yep. on the website here you've got a worksheet so that worksheet is just will help you bring together the three elements we've mm. talked about today and on the back you've got a list of all those different areas you could make a difference in and the roles you could play so that's number one the second attachment is about um, if you're an employer or a HR position and how can you use this to help your team mm. to increase, uh, I guess, engagement with your employees, um, there's, there's a white paper there that will help you through that. So um, outside of that, we, we want to provide, if you come back through Redback or, or through to me, um, there's, there's a booklet here which will step you through everything we've talked about yep. and, and give you a few extra tips as well. So that's available too. Excellent. So I'm just very happy to have the opportunity and, and really uh, have enjoyed this discussion. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and we'll send a recording of this event within 48 hours so you guys can then take a look at it or pass it on to anyone else who you may know. So thank you once for, again for joining us as part of the Business Skills Series and we hope to see you at future events. Have a good afternoon, everyone.